Welcome, I'm glad you're here. This is Jennifer McGuire. Today is all about embossing folders. I'm gonna share with you lots of tips and techniques for making the most of your folders and really making that texture stand out. This was one of those days where I was in the craft room really having a lot of fun, getting inky and trying new things. So I'm hoping you like some of these techniques too. You'll even hear my son come in and have a little discussion with me. He pops in a lot while I'm crafting. I think it's fun to hear their perspective. Okay, let's get started with this example where I show you an easy way to kind of pump up the depth of your embossing folder background and also create a unique window for your sentiment. For this card, I'm using a new 3D embossing folder from Altenew. You can use any embossing folder for this. You could even use a 2D folder and I'll talk about that later. I have a piece of white cardstock that is four and a quarter by five and a half inches and I want to die cut a circle right at the center. I'm gonna show you how I create a template that helps with getting the center point on a card and I can use it over and over. To create the template, I need a scoreboard. I'm using the new Altenew Crafters Essential Scoring Board. This scoreboard is lightweight, it's very easy to use, and it has a little drawer that holds the tool. Now this tool is great for scoring. I love this. It has a very fine tip stylus point that creates a great score line very easily. I also like that this scoreboard has easy to see increments here, so you can easily get the measurement you want. It's marked down to even eighths of an inch. So it makes it easier to follow along with any tutorials and use the measurements that they suggest. I also like that this tool is eight and a half inches tall, so you can easily score a regular piece of cardstock. I'll demonstrate that later. But right now we're gonna make that template to find the center point on your card. This blue piece of cardstock will be the template. It is also cut to four and a quarter by five and a half inches. This is a size card I make most often. Now to find the center point on this, you could measure with the ruler. I'm gonna use my scoreboard. I'm putting a score line right along the halfway point this way, which is two and three quarter inches. Then I'll rotate it and then do the score line at the halfway point this way, which is two and an eighth. This score tool is great because you just do one line and look at that nice score line. Very sharp and you could even create a background of lines this way if you wanted to. All right, now I'm using my scissors just to cut a little V at the end of each of those score lines. This I'm not actually using for today's technique, but in the future, if I ever want to find the center point or a center line on my card, I can use these little notches to help me do so. I'll show you in a moment. So now this piece I can keep. I'm also going to poke a hole right at that center where the score lines cross, and that is the center point of this piece. And I can lay it on top of my cardstock, any kind of card, and place a little dot right there in the center with a pencil, and that is the center point on my card. I used a pen because I couldn't find a pencil, but you get the idea. You could also put little marks here on these notches, and then use a straight edge to connect those notches, and that is your straight center line, both directions on the card. Now I totally know that some people are better at eyeballing these things and don't need templates or don't need to measure. It's totally up to you what you prefer to do. But I know many of you are like me and like to have templates on hand to make your crafting easier, so I wanted to share this process. I just keep my templates all together so that whenever I need them in crafting, I can grab them and go. Okay, so here I have a circle die. I die cut the circle from a piece of scrap cardstock, and I want to find the center point of this circle. So I just fold it in half so that the side edges meet. Then I'm going to fold it again in half the other way so the two score line edges meet. This gives me the center point of the circle. I can poke a hole right there where the two score lines meet, and now I can line that little dot up on our background. All right, so let's make our card. I have a piece of white cardstock, four and a quarter by five and a half inches, putting my template right on top, putting a dot right through that hole, and that is the center point of our card panel. See how quick it was to make that mark now that I have the template made. Now I can put the circle on top, lining up the little hole with the dot on my cardstock. I can hold that circle die cut in place and take the die and pop it right over that circle and run it through my die cut machine. Now I know that circle die cut is cut nicely at the center of our background. 
Now for the colors of this card, I wanted something bold, but I was feeling a little stumped. So I turned to my color catalog, which is where I go for color inspiration often. I will link to a video up here on the top right that talks more about the color catalog. Well, I noticed that they now have a color cube that is coming soon. So you can actually have cards of color suggestions on your desk as you create. I saw the ad for this or uh, image from the color cube and I love the color combo on it. So I'm using that today. I will link below to the color cube if you want to learn more. I can't wait to get mine because I use that color catalog so often. I just find things like this to be a time saver for me. So now I'm applying these colors of ink to my cardstock, starting in the center. So it kind of looks like the color is radiating from that open circle. I'm using one of my large Altenu blending brushes. These are probably the brushes I use the most because you can cover a large area faster and get smoother blending. I have my uh, waffle flower stencil mat that I'm working on, which is just great for blending, but you could blend on any surface. I also have my ink stand here that holds my inks in place as I pick up the color. I just find it helpful to have, but this is something that you can do with absolutely any inks that you may have or any inking tool you may have. These are just what I decided to use for today's video. So I did the pink from the center and then I added a little purple and now I'm putting some yellow in two corners and some orange in the two other colors. And at this point I was thinking this wasn't working for me. I didn't like these results, but then I remembered the trick to ink blending is to always overlap colors significantly. So I went and I added more pink to the background, making sure it, it overlapped more with the yellow and the orange, and that really made a big difference to blend them together. Now it's time to do the embossing folder. I will be using my Spellbinders Platinum 6 today, along with the Universal Platform. I like this new Universal Platform because it comes with lots of plates and shims, so you can figure out what works best for each embossing folder, no guessing game. They have a guide on their website that tells you just what to do. I like to print off with a label and stick it to my platform, so I know what sandwich to use for each embossing folder. For all to new 3D embossing folders, you do the platform, the F shim, your embossing folder, and then the D plate. And that's what I'll be doing today. I again found that on the guide on the Spellbinders website, makes it easy, but you can use these embossing folders with whatever die cut machine you have. This just happens to be what I'm using today. I put a little moisture on the back of this panel with a baby wipe. I didn't want to affect the ink on the front. I'm now lining up our panel inside of the embossing folder. I will close it and you can tape it shut if you're worried about your paper shifting as you manipulate all this. Then we can put our D plate on top of that and run it through our die cut machine. So again, this universal platform is just a bunch of plates and shims that make it easier for you to figure out when to use what sandwich. You can always use the platforms the machine comes with if you prefer. I'm going to set this aside for a moment. We'll come back to it and add to it. This piece again was four and a quarter by five and a half inches, and I don't really want to trim any more off the edge. So I'm making a note card that's slightly bigger than that. So this is a note card that is a little bit bigger than what we normally make. I wanted to show you how I did that. Here is a piece of cardstock that is 11 and a half by four and a half inches. So it's bigger than what we usually use to make a note card. I'm scoring at five and three quarter inches and folding this. This will give me a card that is five and three quarters by four and a half. I like to keep this size on hand because it is slightly bigger, a quarter inch bigger in both directions. Then I don't have to trim down my backgrounds after I've created them. I always start with four and a quarter by five and a half inch backgrounds, but you could again trim the background down smaller if you want it. Now here is how you make a side folding note card that's a little bit bigger. You do nine by five and three quarters, score it four and a half and fold that. So now again, you have a slightly bigger card. Now this is not it, something that you have to do. You can make your cards whatever size you want, but I wanted to show how to make these because a lot of people were asking me. That top folding version, which I like to make the most, does require a longer piece of cardstock. And I will link below to the cardstock I use for that. 12 by 12 would work too. 
All right, so now on the front of that note card, I'm centering my template and putting a dot where the center is. Then I'm putting my circle on top of that, lining up the circle die and running that through my die cut machine. So thanks to that template, I was easily able to add a circle die cut at the center of this note card and my panel will line up with it nicely. So again, the panel is four and a quarter by five and a half. The note card is a quarter inch bigger in both directions. Okay, so now let's add more ink to this. I want that background to really stand out more. And the key to making your embossing folder background stand out more is to add ink. And I'm gonna show you a few different ways to do so today. This one is the easiest and can be done with any folder. All I'm doing is using my large ink blending tool to lightly apply ink over the raised areas. It's hard to tell here, but I'm not pressing firmly. I only want the raised areas of the background to grab the ink. And I'm using colors that are similar, but a bit darker. So now those raised areas are darker, the background softer, and you can see how that stands out much more. Now I'm using liquid adhesive to glue our background onto our note card. And I thought it'd be fun to do something different with my sentiments here. I thought it'd be fun to have one suspended across this window and two glued on the inside. So you see something different when the card is open and closed. I'm using the Altenew Bold Sentiment stamp set. I did a whole video on how to use this set and tips for using a template when stamping on sentiment strips. I know a lot of you said that you found it helpful, so I will link to that video up here on the top right. I will be using that template today. Here is the little template. Again, check out that video to see how. And all these little die cut sentiment strips. I could have just cut those by hand, they're uh, three eighths of an inch tall, but I used that Altenew Featured Sentiments die set because I find it really handy to just die cut all my strips and have them ready. So here's my Misty stamping tool. I have a sticky mat in there from Brutus Monroe. It's helpful to hold things in place. And I have stamped my sentiment on a piece of scrap cardstock. You can stamp it anywhere. I then take my template and I put it around my sentiment. See how it's centered between the top and bottom of that gap in the template. I remove my scrap piece from under there, and now any sentiment strip that I put into that opening on my template, I can be sure that that sentiment is stamped perfectly on it. So see how it's stamped just right. No eyeballing it, no trying to get it centered on the strip. This template is helpful for that. Again, you can check out that video to see how I created it. So I'm going to stamp a bunch of these bold sentiments on these cardstock strips. After I'm done, I can trim the sides off and I have these nice black sentiments with a fine white trim around the edge. These will stand out nicely against my bold note card. I will also do one of my other favorite tricks for making a sentiment stand out and that is to stack up some dimension behind it. So I'm gluing two cardstock strips behind our sentiment trimming them off the edge, and then these will stand out even better. Also, the sentiments will hold up nicely through the mail because they're stronger now. On my longer sentiment, I put adhesive along the back left edge and back right edge, and I glued it right over the window on our card. So now it's suspended across it. I am also gluing a piece of four and a quarter by five and a half inch white cardstock to the inside. This cardstock that I use for the base of this note card is thinner than what I usually use. So by putting that extra piece of cardstock on the inside, it'll be stronger. No one wants a floppy card. Now I'm gluing the other two sentiments that I stacked right above the others. And these are glued inside of the card. When you open up the card, there is that gap in the middle now, so I thought I would stamp there another sentiment from a different sentiment uh, stamp set. This is the Strips 2 stamp set, and I am lining that up in my stamping tool, and I'll stamp this one in pink. So when the card is closed, you do not see this, but when you open it, you see this fun additional pink sentiment, which I just think is a fun way to change things up. So at this point, I just wanted to leave in some audio from my son and I. He comes in when I'm crafting and I do film audio as I'm filming my video and I left this part in. Okay, do I put gems here? Like in the I pattern so. or leave it? I think you leave it. You know how hard that is for me to do? Why? I love to overdo things yeah, but and then regret it. Yeah, simple aspect is good. 
Yes, simple is very good. Okay, then I'm not going to add gems because you said not to. Okay. Mm. I'm channeling my inner CZ designs. Right. Kathy Zilski. Is she She's, like a simple? Yes, amazing simple parts. I just thought it'd be fun to leave that in there. So I was talking about Kathy Zilski, who is an amazing card maker and masters the clean and simple look. I will link to her YouTube channel here. Be sure to check it out. And that's my son, Colin, who is 16. All right, so here is the completed card. I just thought it was fun to add that depth of color to that embossing folder background and make a slightly bigger card so that I could keep my panel at full size. I didn't want to trim anything off that. Because my card is a bit bigger, I am using a bigger envelope. This is an A6 envelope size. The white one is. You can see how it's bigger than an A2 envelope. The postage requirements on this envelope is the same. You could even use a 5x7. All right, let's create a couple butterfly cards. These were so fun and pretty fast to create, and I want to do more and more colors. For this, I used this new embossing folder from Altenu. This is a 3D embossing folder, but you could use 2D for this also. Any kind of embossing folder where there's an area you can cut out would be ideal. There are also coordinating stencils available to add color to this embossing folder, which I think is so much fun. I'm thankful companies have this to offer. However, I'll show you how to use them separately too. So I have a piece of cardstock here that I'm putting into the embossing folder, following the same sandwich, running that through my die cut machine. If you find your impression isn't that good, you can add a cardstock shim, or try adding some water to your cardstock first for deeper impression. So there I cut it from white cardstock, such a beautiful look, and I'm using my scissors to cut around this shape. This is a fun technique for any time you have an embossing folder where there's an area you can cut out. So we're going to use this as a mask and also make a bonus card. Now I have a piece of light blue cardstock, which will be the background of my card. And this is cut to four and a quarter by five and a half inches. I'm now lining up that mask on top of our blue background. Now this mask I could have cut from masking paper, but I cut it from cardstock so that the butterfly that we cut out from the center can be used on another card. We'll come back to that in a moment. I'm now using tape to tape the mask on top of my cardstock. I used a lot of tape there. I probably didn't need that much, but I will wipe the ink off this tape when I'm done and reuse the pieces a few times. Now I'm using that same large blending tool from Altenew and applying a light amount of ink over the opening. I'm putting the ink colors on the screen in case you want to try out the same combination. But again, any inks in any colors would work here. Now I'm using the stencils and lining that up with my embossing folder background to add color. This is why it's fun to have the stencils to go with the embossing folders, because you can get color and select areas. However, keep in mind you could also do creative masking if you want to, or stay tuned for my next card where I don't use the stencils. So I used a variety of blue inks here and there just to add all of that look of dimension to our background. Again, the key to making your embossing folder background stand out more is to add ink. And remember, white pigment ink is great too because it softens areas. I'll show more about the power of white pigment ink a little later in this video. I do have an ink blending tool that I use just for white ink, and that just kind of softens some of the edges on this background. All right, so now we can remove our mask, and we could use the mask a few times, and look at that result. I wish you could see the texture in real life. Now this is the butterfly that we cut out from the white cardstock when we made our mask. I'm not using the stencils here. I'm just applying ink over it. I first applied a light color blue with a heavier hand. Then every time I add a darker color of blue, I use a lighter hand. That way the darker color is only on the raised areas, which is another great way of really making the texture pop. I did use this stencil just to make that body area a little bit darker, but you could do that without the stencil too. After I do inking over an embossing folder background, sometimes I like to put it back in the folder, lining it up with the pattern, it kind of pops onto the dimension, and then running it back through, just to really define that texture a bit more. I'm sometimes afraid I kind of smushed it a little bit, which really doesn't happen since the paper is stretched and changed, but if you want to really make sure it pops, just run it through the embossing folder one more time after you've done all of your inking. 
Another way to add color to your embossing folder texture is to use a marker and apply it lightly over the raised areas. It's actually pretty easy to do, so you can get really precise with color this way. All right, so I trimmed those backgrounds down, added them to note cards. On the blue butterfly, the solid one that we cut out, I did add little white dots with a gel pen just to make it stand out a bit more since it's a solid blue butterfly. The card on the left, I trimmed down to be four by five and a quarter, and I glued it right up on the top left corner of a four and a quarter by five and a half inch note card, just for a little bit of a different design. Here you can see the beautiful texture and color that we were able to get by using the embossing folder and stencils together. I really wish I could capture the texture and dimension in my video and photos, but you're just gonna have to trust me, it's beautiful. All right, now for this one, you can see the white dots that I added, and I just glued that butterfly to a white note card. Now the sentiments for these are from an older Altenew stamp set that I use a lot in videos because it has the coordinating dies for the sentiments available also. This is the colorful soul bundle, and I thought the sentiments from this were perfect for our blue cards. Okay, now I have a completely different technique for you with embossing folders. This one is fast to do, super fun, and I think I'm gonna have to do more in future videos. This time we're doing, going to do kind of a watercolor look. I'm using this new Alta New Hasta embossing folder. It's 3D once again, but 2D would work. There are coordinating stencils available to coordinate with it. I will do an example with and without the stencils because I know not everyone has stencils to line up with their embossing folders. I am making a really big change here. Instead of using white cardstock, which I've been using all along, this time I'm using watercolor paper. You can use whatever watercolor paper you want. I'm using Tim Holtz white watercolor paper. And I did put a cardstock shim in there to make a deeper impression on this watercolor paper. I'm using Tim Holtz Distress Ink because it reacts really well with water. Any kind of ink that reacts with water would work here. And I'm just roughly applying three colors of green Distress Ink over the raised areas of the embossing folder, just going direct to paper, not taking much care at all to get a good look. This will look a little rough at first. We're adding water to it and the water will, or the ink will start to bleed and it'll look rough. Don't worry about it. Just take it and set it aside and let it dry. While that dries, let's do another. This is again watercolor paper with the same embossing folder. This time I'm putting the stencils on top. These stencils line up with the texture. This way I can get different leaves, different colors. So I went direct to paper with the Distress Ink then I used a blending brush on top of that just to kind of blend some of that ink around onto the openings. So this will give us a more solid color background. So here applying ink direct to paper, then kind of brushing that ink in. Do not spend a lot of time on this because this is something that we will add water to, which will change it up anyway. And now we'll do the third layer here with Twisted Citron. So you could leave this as is, just let it dry. And we have that texture kind of enhanced by the ink we put over the raised areas. But I'm going to spray this with water too. And I'm spraying it pretty generously. It'll look like a hot mess. Set it aside and let it do its thing. Distress inks do the work for us. While those dry completely, let's get our sentiment ready. This sentiment look I'll do several times throughout this video. For this, I'm using the Altenew Build a Garden Tulips and Friends stamp set. This is an amazing stamp set. I used it in a recent video. I'll link to it up here on the top right. In here are lots of sentiments that are great to stamp anywhere on your card, in the inside, on the envelope flap, or on a sentiment strip on the front. I white heat embossed some of the sentiments on black cardstock. This one said, so very thank or grateful for you, but I cut off the word you from the sentiment so that I could instead put this large die cut you behind it. These are the Altenew Bold Alphabet dies. I cut these three times from white cardstock and glued them together so they stand out nicely. I'm lining the letters up straight on a sticky mat just to make sure I get the spacing just right and get them even. I put a piece of tape over it to pick them up together put liquid adhesive on the back, and then I can pick this up and put it anywhere I want on my card. You can see that this is easy to do, and this is one of my reused pieces of tape from earlier in the video. 
So this is the background that I created by using the stencil to get different colors of green in different areas. It's dried and it has this beautiful watercolor look. I trimmed it down and put it on a four and a quarter by five and a half inch white note card. So let's take a closer look at that one. You can see that I did add some little Trinity Stamps confetti around it just for a little bit of sparkle, just scattered them here and there. I love this technique of using the distress inks and watercolor paper and water on an embossing folder background because it's a fast way to get a watercolor look with texture. But this one's my favorite. This is where we just did the watercolor paper with the embossing folder, brushed some inks on top without the stencils, sprayed it with water, and you can see how the darker color is on the raised areas, the softer watercolor goes to the backgrounds or the valleys, and you get beautiful watercolor texture. I'll definitely be doing this in another video soon. It's fast and gives fun results. For this next one, I thought I'd use the embossing folder and stencils together, but share some tips for you on inking embossing folder backgrounds. Now this is a new bundle from Altenew, but they are sold separately and work very well separately. You have the embossing folder and the layering stencils, and you can create these really cool looking geometric backgrounds, and you can use any colors you want. It's pretty neat how this one works. There's a guide that shows you the best way to use it. I have already done the embossing folder on my regular white cardstock here, and I'm lining up each of the stencils and applying ink over them. I do find I get the best results when I use the embossing folder first and then do the inking when trying to line up my stencils with the coordinating embossing folder. You can do it the other way, but I find you take the risk of cracking your paper and disrupting your inking but you can experiment and find what works for you. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. So the embossing folder has already been done here. I'm just using the stencils as they recommend. I will be using all of the stencils, which pretty much covers the entire textured area. If you want to, you can skip some of them so you have some white showing through. You could create a lot of different patterns and different looks by changing it up each time. To save time, I'm going to skip through some of the inking, but I just use different shades of blue and green ink. And look at the final result. I love that texture and bold color. Now off screen, I did do a, something a little different. I did the inking first with the stencils, then the embossing folder. That's the one on the right. You can see how my paper cracked a little bit, which makes it not look as sharp. My inking doesn't look as sharp. I wasn't able to spray water on that because I did the inking. So I do feel you get best results if you do the embossing folder first, then the inking on top. Here's a closer look at that texture. I love how it really stands out and the color makes it pop. But remember, you can use these embossing folders and stencils separately too. If you have an embossing folder alone with no stencils, you could always use markers to just color the different raised areas different colors. All right, here is another example. This one, I actually have two that I'll be doing in two different ways. On this first one, we'll do the power of white pigment ink on a textured background. I'll be using the Altenew Flower Vines uh, 3D embossing folder and coordinating stencils. Once again, they're available separately or together. Let's start by doing the embossing folder and adding ink over the stencils, how it's originally intended to be used. So I already did the first stencil, which does the stems on those uh, branches. Now I'm lining up the second stencil, which is the leaves. One thing I do encourage doing with simple stencils like this is to use multiple colors over an opening. So here I did like a light green and then I added some dark green in the corners. That way you get the look of dimension. You're actually adding more to that dimensional look. Here's the third and final stencil. This does the flowers. This one's really easy to do each flower a different color because they're spaced out nicely. So I took the opportunity to just do a really colorful floral background. Now you could leave this as is, but I wanted to do the trick that I've shown in videos before, and that is to roll a little bit of white pigment ink over the raised areas. So I have a good white pigment ink here, any would work and a Tim Holtz Brer. And I'm just rolling the white pigment ink over the raised areas. You can see how the raised areas right away grab that white pigment ink. I then use a dry cloth to kind of dab off the excess and blend it in a little bit. And this really makes the color stand out more and the dimension stand out more. 
This time the raised areas are white and the darker colors behind it, opposite of what we've been doing all along. So I trimmed that down, added a black mat to that piece, and added it to a white note card, and did the sentiment as we've done before. So here you can really get a better look at that texture thanks to that white pigment ink on top, and it was very fast and easy to do. If you don't have a brayer, you can use a blending tool, but do it soft-handed. You don't want the white pigment ink to cover up all the color, just the raised areas. My next card uses the same products, but I'm doing everything backwards. So stick with me, you'll see why. I have a piece of white cardstock and I'm using the layering stencils upside down. So I'm not doing the embossing folder first. This time I'm doing the stenciling. So I have my stencil upside down and I'm inking over it. Now I know it's upside down because Altenew engraves the numbers of the stencils on the front of the, of the stencil. So I'm just making sure it's upside down. And I'll do this with each of the stencils. Now to make sure I'm lining it up, here's a trick. You hold your two stencils together, the one you've already inked on top, and you line up the stems there, that brown part. Then you remove that top stencil, and I know that the next one is in the right position. Normally, I would line up over the texture that I did with the embossing folder, but this time, we're starting with the inking first. So now I will ink up all of the leaves, and remember, the stencil is upside down. After doing the leaves, I'll line up the third stencil, the floral one. This again is upside down, and I'll add inking over that. Now this time I decided to make all of my flowers the same color, which saves a lot of time. I did it all in pink ink, but then I used a smaller blending brush with some purple to add a little variation. That's why those small blending brushes are handy too. Okay, so now we have our inking done. We're going to put this into our embossing folder. I put a little moisture on the back of it. We don't want to do it over the inks because we don't want to mess that up. Now this time we're using our embossing folder upside down because remember we did the reverse, we flipped our stencils over. So we're lining up our inking with the embossing folder, the back of the embossing folder, and running it through our die cut machine. It won't line up perfectly, but that's because I did the inking first. This time, what's fun about this is the ink is in the valleys, in the lower parts, because we're using the back. And that way, we can stamp on the raised area, which is the background, the white area. It's all about using your products creatively. Okay, so now I'm putting this into my stamping tool. I have the Altenew Dainty Swiss Dot Stamp, and I'm stamping that over it. Now, the colored areas are indented, right? So the ink won't land there. It only lands on the background. Now I did try to stamp this with frosty pink ink, a light pink ink, but it turns out my stamp was dirty and had green ink on it, but look it, it worked out great anyway. So now the stamping is on the background only because that's what's raised. So I trimmed that down, added it to a four and a quarter by five and a half inch white note card, and again did the sentiment in the little sequence in the same way. So this is the opposite of the last card. In our last card, the flowers were raised, in this card, the flowers are kind of indented, or they're the valleys. It's just a fun way to use your products in a different way. Okay, now let's do one more card, just because it was fast to make, and you could make a bunch of these really quickly. It uses the new Altenew Playful Circles embossing folder, which is one of the coolest embossing folders I've ever used. The 3D dots on this are so bold and stand out so much, it's, a, it, it's just really cool. However they designed it really makes it stand out. So because this has such great raised areas, I'm able to apply ink only to the raised areas and keep the background white. I do recommend using a blending brush that has the little bristles very close together, like these from Altenew, or you can use a Tim Holtz ink blending tool, which has a foam tip. That way you can very lightly only apply ink to the raised areas. Once again, I'm doing the trick where I apply ink in a broad area and then overlap the colors. So I'm only using yellow, pink, pool, and green inks here, but overlapping them to form greens and purples and oranges. Now again, you want to go very light-handed over the raised areas so the background stays white. So fast to do and look at that great result. This time I decided to skip the sequins and only use gold cardstock for the U and just allow that background to show. So if you have a favorite embossing folder background, try this technique. 
I do think this works best with embossing folders that create a lot of dimension because you can really just put the ink on the raised areas only. If you have a 2D embossing folder, maybe a dot one like this, try using a marker to apply ink to the raised areas only. I hope you had fun getting inky with me today for these embossing folder ideas. If you want to check out any that I use today, they're linked below in my YouTube description. Also at the end here, I'll link to a couple other related videos so you can try out more ideas for your embossing folders. I appreciate you taking this time to spend with me today. I know my videos are long, but I hope you learned a thing or two. Thanks for watching. See you soon.